All right, good afternoon everyone again. We can go ahead and get started on uh, the 2020 webinar series and today we're just going to be kicking off the year with a review of 2019 MSHA enforcement uh, as long with a 2024 class. So what can we ex expect from the agency in the year to come? Uh, if you've been on our webinar series before, welcome back. Uh, I am your typical host, Nick Scala. I am the chair of Con Maciel Carey's National MSHA Workplace Safety Group. Um, we represent companies all over the country in the mining industry, both uh, independent contractors and production operators in, in all aspects of dealing with the agency, uh, whether that is managing inspections and handling contests or coming out for uh, whistleblower investigations or other types of agent liability investigations. Uh, but we're uh, a pretty much a one-stop shop for your MSHA defense needs uh, if those are there, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll give you the uh, ammunition you need to avoid getting in any scraps with MSHA in 2020. So I think as we talked about, we're just going to see uh, an overview of the enforcement in 2019. And you got to say that there isn't a lot of data out there um, right now. MSHA <clears throat> early in the year is still updating their 2019 enforcement data and haven't, hasn't made a lot of that public yet. So we'll sift through what we, we do know and do have. Uh, we're also going to look at the initiative program. Now, this is something that we didn't see a great deal under uh, the Obama administration, but certainly under the Trump administration with Assistant Secretary Zetezolo, MSHA has put out initiatives uh, now pretty regularly or annually uh, about safety areas or areas that they have determined you know, are the cause of more uh, serious or fatal injuries. Uh, so we'll take a look at what the agency is going to be doing in 2020 on that route. Um, we're then going to take a look at what's happening in rulemaking with MSHA. Uh, it has been a bit more active in the rulemaking area than I think many expected uh, when we got uh, the Trump administration in place. And, you know, I really think that this year, uh, going to be an election year, uh, we might even see a, a proposed rule uh, or two um, put out by MSHA. So we'll see what happens on that front, but uh, those are some areas that I think we could actually see some movement. Lastly, we will touch on what is the status now of MSHA's workplace exam rule. We've been talking about this now since 2016, and it consistently has uh, items of note for us to discuss. And so hopefully this is the last one. Uh, you know, it is possible that there could be more changes in the future, but for a while I think we might be having a rule in place. Um, we're also going to look at just some, some real high level predictions about what we could see uh, from OSHA, or I'm sorry, MSHA in 2020, um, as well as, you know, where the agency could continue to go in their enforcement and rulemaking. So let's, let's just start off with some real high level data. But this is a comparison of MSHA enforcement um, over the years from 2015 to 2019. Now those dates were selected because 2015 and 2016 were the last two years under the Obama administration and 2017, 18, 19 uh, are the years of enforcement under the Trump administration. Um, and really, you know, I think we can see that there aren't a great deal of changes. Uh, the mine numbers have remained relatively stable throughout that time frame. Uh, as well as the number of minors, um, the fatalities have decreased a bit, and we're looking right now like 2019 may be the lowest total of uh, fatal injuries in the mining industry since MSHA has been in existence, so that's a very good thing. Um, as I mentioned, some of the data is still coming in on injury rates and all injury rates, uh, inspection hours. We will see a slight uptick this year in the number of citations issued, we are going to be just shy of 100,000, uh, so it will be 99,663. Um, so again, teetering at a pretty stable level between the last five years. The one thing of note is the slight decline in the number uh, or percentage of SNS citations. So we last year, or I should say in 2018, uh, had an average of 20% being SNS. Um, 
we'll see if that is actually below 20% for 2019. Some of the rumblings I've heard is that it is. Um, and that would be, you know, an interesting development to be under 20% for, you know, I'm not quite sure, but likely one of the first times in, in the real reasonable future. Um, or I'm sorry, reasonable past. But if we're looking at this, it's also important to look at the difference between the different sectors. And I know that MSHA is touting right now their blurring or their one MSHA initiative. And that's been going on the last couple years with 2019 really seeing the lion's share of changes made. Um, we'll continue to talk about that uh, more in the presentation or in the webinar today. But, you know, we want to still look at some of the differences between coal and metal and non-metal. Because from an enforcement perspective, you know, there are still differences between them that affect the overall picture of what the enforcement scheme is. So one item to note right from the get-go is that coal mines, uh, which are the ones we, the stats we have up right now, you know, are really a relatively small portion of the overall mines. Okay, we had 1,100 mines, give or take, in 2019 producing coal. Um, of that, about 83,000 miners. So, if to look back at what we saw in the previous slide, there's almost 13,000 mines in the country. Um, of that, the vast majority of them are surface, metal, non-metal. So, we have, you know, roughly 12,000, a little less, metal non-metal mines compared to 1,100 coal mines. Um, similarly, with the workforce, we have about 250,000 miners in metal non-metal and about 83,000 in coal. So quite a disparity when you look at that. Um, enforcement, though, resources, uh, you know, we looked at they, they're pretty equal. Um, in terms of citations and orders, issued. If we just want to look back at, at 2018, uh, coal had about 47,000 citations issued of the 97,000 total. Uh, so all very, very close to equal. Uh, in terms of dollars assessed, uh, in 2018, coal had about $32 million in penalties uh, of the $55 million total. So a bit more citations for the metal non-metal sector compared to coal but less penalties in the metal on that metal sector. Uh, one area that I think is specifically interesting to look at um, is the total mining area inspection hours per mine. Uh, and in coal, we can see in 2018, that was almost 200, well, it was 240 hours uh, inspecting mining areas. And I think that, you know, that is a much higher number. If we look at the total mining area inspection hours of all, mines, it was uh, 52 hours. And if we keep going forward, and I've changed now to the metal non-metal statistics, we can see that the total mining area inspection hours is 23 uh, for metal non-metal mines. So it really just, just goes to reinforce um, really the distinction between the two. And while we have many, many, many less coal mines than metal non-metal mines, the resources um, and enforcement resources are more evenly allocated because of the time spent inspecting coal mines. Um, and then that obviously in turn is reflected in the penalties assessed, um, that dollar number, as well as the number of citations issued. So, you know, looking at this metal non-metal statistics that we have up right now, we can see that for 2018 there was about 50, 1,000, uh, a little, little less citations issued, and about $23 million in penalties assessed. Uh, same SNS level, hovering around that 20%, um, but really the, you know, kind of the interesting take in this side is the number of hours uh, in, that you see MSHA spent at each metal non-metal mine versus a coal mine doing inspections. Also, if we look at the injury rates between coal and metal non-metal, and I'm just going to move back to the first slide. So this is all mines. Our injury rate was about 2.05. Um, and then again, that is looked at the injuries per 200,000 hours worked. In coal, it was about 2.88, so the highest of 
the average and between metal non metal, and then metal non metal is 1.74. Um, so that overall number is you know, pulled up a bit by the slight raise in the metal non metal industry, about one injury more per 200,000 hours than uh, the metal non metal. And you know that is that is again something that is going to affect the enforcement resources. And the reason I'm going into all this is because you consistently hear around the country, you know, why is MSHA have such a focus on the coal industry versus metal non metal when the number of mines and the number of miners are so heavily skewed towards metal non metal. And <clears throat> You know, part of that reason that MSHA has to allocate resources in a certain way is due to how much time it takes to inspect a mine and the number of citations and penalties assessed at those mines, and that is obviously tied back into the injury rates. Um, one interesting thing is for the last two years, uh, both 2019 and 2018, the fatal injuries in the metal nine metal industry have outpaced those in coal. Um, so this year, 2019, or I should say this past year, there was 13 fatal injuries in metal non-metal and 11 in coal. And in 2018, that number was 16 in metal non-metal and 12 in coal. Um, and that really kind of bucks a normal trend where uh, metal non-metal was being outpaced by coal. Um, that changed a bit in 2015, 2017. But in the years prior to that, uh, historically, you saw coal with more fatal mining injuries in the metal non-metal industry. And I think, you know, part of the reason those changes have taken effect is due to the redu reduction in coal mining, uh, the reduction in the number of people working in the mines and the tons put out. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, a lot more mines, almost 12 times the mines in the metal non-metal industry, but our enforcement statistics are still very close between metal, non-metal, and coal. And that um, is one reason that we're seeing this merger between the two, uh, because even though metal, non-metal, again, has quite has many more miners and mines, um, the enforcement deems that coal will still be on equal footing. So just a brief overview in comparison of the two areas that uh, we are now having merged into one. Uh, but, you know, AMSHA can say they're doing a merger of both divisions, but you know that really means that they have one person over top, an administrator of enforcement, and then he has two deputies, one for coal and one for metal non-metal. I think what we're going to find at some point in the future, uh, especially if this administration and this AMSHA leadership uh, stays in place after this year's election, um, that there might be a more consolidation of the districts um, and the district offices. But, you know, we'll get to that as we talk about that one MSHA initiative later on. Uh, looking back and continuing to focus, though, on the enforcement, uh, these numbers weren't included in the chart that MSHA had published right now for 2019, but we we're able to locate them in some other areas and some other materials put out by MSHA. Um, but there was a 34, or I'm sorry, 37,471 inspections completed in 2019. Um, for those keeping track, that would mean that MSHA completed all of their mandatory twos and fours, as they call them. So every underground mine was inspected at least four times in 2019 by MSHA, and every surface mine was inspected at least twice. Now, I think that most people will tell you, or most operators I talk with, will tell you that they saw MSHA a bit more frequently than that, whether it's because of the inspectors coming on site for both regular inspections and then compliance follow-ups, or they're, they're coming on site to do outreach because of the enforcement initiatives, um, or something of those nature. But, you know, MSHA is statutorily required to do those twos and fours each year um, for quite some time they were having trouble getting their twos and fours done, um, but for the last decade or so that has been a big priority and they have been making it uh, a point of emphasis to make sure they're getting 100% completion and last year was no different. Um, as we talked about, we have roughly a quarter million miners in the metal non-metal sector um, compared to 83,000 in 
coal. Uh, together, that makes the workforce under MSHA about roughly 330,000. Now, of that, MSHA estimates that about 25% is contractors or our contractors around the country. Um, and that is something that we're going to look at when we get into the initiatives because one thing MSHA found or a trend that they have been discussing since 2019 is that there was a spike, uh, especially in the metal non metal industry, in contractor fatalities uh, and a disproportionate spike for the 25% of the workforce that contractors make up. So MSHA is going to be looking at that and paying closer attention to contractors when you're, they're on site. Um, we all know that we have to keep our contractor log of everyone that's on site. It will probably be even more common than it is now that when the inspectors come on site, they want to see that log, want to know what contractors are on site that day, and that the inspections will likely commence for the contractors immediately. Um, so you just want to be cognizant of that because you want to make sure you're getting all your site specific done, uh, as well as make sure you're monitoring the contractors so that they are following all required procedures and regulations uh, while on site. Another area that I thought was an interesting statistic uh, was the issuance of 107A or imminent danger orders. And we really saw a spike about this back in the 2014-2015 timeframe uh, when there had been a rather significant spike in metal and non-metal fatalities. And at that point in time, Assistant Secretary Joe Maine told everyone in a stakeholder meeting that he was going to encourage inspectors to utilize imminent danger orders. Now, imminent danger orders, for those of you who don't know, do not carry a penalty, um, but they are an immediate withdrawal of a piece of equipment or an area of a mine or a miner who was performing some duty or task in an unsafe manner um, until that can be abated or corrected. Now, they always will have an associated 104A or many times a 104D a vulnerable failure order associated with them that will, will hold a penalty. Uh, but they are a relatively strong type of issuance. Um, and following that, there was some litigation regarding the issuances of 107A uh, and determining should M should be vacating these citations uh, after the fact, and if it's found that there wasn't an imminent danger. And there were several decisions that really came out and gave the inspectors a great deal of leeway to continue issuing imminent danger for whatever they saw fit, because uh, the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission applied a very uh, liberal test of deference or determining whether or not, or trying to determine whether or not the inspector abused their discretion. Um, and so that kind of, what it did was it emboldened the inspectors for some time to continue issuing 107As, really without fear of reprisal for them being vacated by the agency or by operators in litigation, uh, without the operators proving beyond any, any doubt that there was no imminent danger. So, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that it couldn't happen and that 107As weren't vacated in that time frame, but it was uh, a relatively difficult task. Now, since there has been other cases uh, that aren't controlling but are persuasive that have somewhat walked that back, uh, and we continue to focus on those and monitor those when we're litigating a 107A, um, but just to have some idea, in 2015 there was 317 107 A's issued. Uh, in 2018, there was 180. The numbers aren't out for 2019 yet, but based off of some trending and what they have reported, uh, it would have been more so in line or at least expected if the trending continued to be around that 144 mark. So a pretty steep decline in a no number of years, a relatively short period of time. Um, but it is, so they aren't being issued as often or as frequently, but it is important to notice or to know if you do get a 107A and you wish to contest it, and I, I recommend that you do contest 107As when you get them because there is still an opportunity for them to be vacated, and that's especially true if you're a contractor and pre-qualification is an issue for you or a concern. Um, you need to do so within 30 days of issuance because you are not going to get a penalty 
for that 107A. They are not going to send you a mailing with your penalty for that citation and then you can contest it at that time. You have to file what is called a notice of contest. Uh, and if you don't do that within 30 days of the 107A being issued, uh, you essentially are now facing quite an uphill battle to get that reopened because you have to now file a motion to reopen for uh, the order with the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission uh, or, you know, at the same time, a motion for a request to file late. Uh, and those can take a great deal of time to get approved. And by the time you do finally get that approved or denied by the Federal Mine Safety and Health Review Commission, often the rest of the citations have already been litigated and settled. Um, so again, just be aware of that. 107 A's, we don't see them as often. They are not a normally reported statistic from MSHA, but <clears throat> they are something that you have to pay attention to because they are still issued and you, you know, if you do see them come out, they do have different obligations for contesting. Um, so if anyone ever comes across that, you want any help or want to discuss whether or not you've been filing a notice of contest, I welcome you to reach out to me. Happy to just discuss what you're what you're looking at. Um, continuing to look at 2019 though, one area that we talked about earlier is the fatalities uh, for this year. And in 2019 it was the lowest on record for MSHA. Now those 24 fatalities, it could be up to 26. MSHA is currently still reviewing two more that may or may not be chargeable to the mining industry. And what that means is you're probably looking at an instance where a miner had a heart attack or something of the nature on a mine site. Uh, and after review, MSHA may determine um, that the heart attack was or was not due to work conditions or work relatedness. Uh, and if that's the case, that they determined they were not work-related, well, that number will stay at 24 fatalities for 2019. Uh, it could go up to 26, which would make the year still the second lowest rate of fatal, fatal injuries uh, since MSHA has been keeping track. So there has been a positive trend in lowering the fatalities uh, by the industry, and I think that should be applauded. Um, obviously, though, there's still ways to go. But if you're looking at it, from the perspective of, of the mining industry, um, the trend is going in the right direction. Now, another area that is getting quite a bit of attention in terms of statistics um, from the mining industry and also from MSHA, but also pressure uh, kind of on the agency from the political standpoint is health sampling. Now, when we talk about health sampling, uh, this is going to obviously be, you know, respirable coal dust um, for the coal mining industry. It can be diesel particulate for the uh, underground community. Uh, but more often than not, um, it is going to be health sampling at respirable dust or quartz levels. Um, and that is the area that see, has seen the increased attention by MSHA. Um, now, it can also include the audiometric testing, uh, but for the purposes of the statistics that we're looking at, it's going to be courts focused because when the Trump administration was elected and Assistant Secretary Zatezalo finally got confirmed back in 2017, increasing the health sampling, specifically respirable courts, was on their to-do list. Um, and those samples have increased significantly. Um, so MSHA, before they did samples here and there, but there was not really the resources um, put into conducting widespread sampling. And that and that has really changed. So you can now expect that at most operations, especially those that are going to have high likelihood of respirable dust or quartz, um, which quartz is, respirable quartz is what MSHA calls silica, you, you should probably expect that you're going to be tested at some point in time. Um, a lot of this has to do with the recent discovery of another spike in uh, black lung in Appalachia that was uh, really made big news a couple years ago. There's now thoughts that those could instead be silicosis outbreaks. Um, so, you know, their OSHA has released in the last few years their own new rule on silica exposure. MSHA, on the other hand, is still utilizing a rule um, and threshold limit value, which is 
the limit that they enforce from the 1973 um, ACGIH levels. So there is there is a push in Washington for MSHA to update their regulation. Uh, part of that has been the push in enforcement, uh, which is showing high levels of compliance and lower levels of overexposures in both coal and metal nonmetal. Um, but there is there is nonetheless still a push on that front. So we'll see what happens. Um, that is one of the areas that we'll talk about in a bit with the record keeping prognosis. Um, I'm sorry, not record keeping, but rulemaking. I should say that uh, you know, in terms of the fatalities as well, MSHA has announced you know there's been this powered haulage safety initiative the last couple of years that has focused really on three aspects. Um, and we can just look at that right now. So it is going to be mobile equipment, uh, primarily at surface mines, seat belt usage, and conveyor belt safety. Um, that has, for the last few years, MSHA announces you know, quite frequently that it has been roughly 50% of all fatals have fallen into those three categories or the larger category of powered haulage. Um, this year, that was down to 25%. So that was a, a good thing to see in terms of uh, positive developments uh, in curbing that safety risk. Um, this is an area, though, that there is a possibility for rulemaking. And the rulemaking could be anything from new rules on the mandate of sensors or cameras um, on mobile equipment, uh, such as a backup camera, or proximity sensors on the areas around it, much like most or many uh, personal vehicles have today, uh, but also it could be the requirement that each mine have maintained and develop a powered haulage safety program. Um, so you know that is that is an area that our goal mine operators should be prepared for one to be an emphasis during their inspections, and two that it is a likely candidate for MSHA's next attempt in rulemaking. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of outreach. I think you're going to consider to see a lot, of, continue to see a lot of outreach with MSHA on powered haulage safety, uh, especially with lowering the percentage of fatal injuries attributed to power haulage. That um, you know, MSHA obviously sees that as a, a nexus or a link to their safety initiative, and I think that's going to be one reason we're going to see a continued push there. Um, what we need to take from it is also the importance of training and retraining and enforcing training. And, you know, that can be with conveyor belt safety uh, and guards and lockout tagout operations, but also just with seatbelt usage, continuing to enforce and train that. And, you know, I will say from really from a, a liability perspective, at least with MSHA, being our primary concern with liability, uh, there there are some changes that have taken place. Um, I think that this administration has really taken a more, I want to say, common sense approach to enforcement, especially after um, a fatal injury uh, or a serious injury takes place, and they are giving giving operators more credit for training provided. Um, just at the end of last year, there was a fatal injury uh, at a metal non-metal mine. <clears throat> it was for a miner who had uh, turned over their vehicle and been thrown from the vehicle at that time. Um, it was discovered during the investigation that the miner was not wearing his seatbelt, but had been trained on that uh, multiple times by the operator. In the end, MSHA did not issue a citation to the operator based on that training. Um, and I think in the past, we probably would have seen multiple citations for failure to wear a seatbelt, failure to adequately train on the use of seatbelts or the requirement of use of seatbelts. Um, and the language in the final report would have probably said something along the lines of this was caused by management's failure to require the use of seatbelts. Um, so a bit of a shift in what they are looking at and how they are reacting after uh, fatal and serious injuries. So you want to make sure that if you are doing training on anything, even something as simple as using a seatbelt, we want to document that training. and We want to document who received it and when they received it and 
in what form it was delivered. It could be a flyer, it could be a discussion as a toolbox talk, it could be during annual refresher, whatever it might be, and it could be multiple of those. We want to make sure that we are documenting it and maintaining our records there because training documentation is being taken into consideration a great deal uh, by the current administration over top of MSHA uh, than it was in the last. And that is a good thing, but it also puts the onus on operators to continue to make those records. Okay, because if we can tell them we, till we're blue in the face that we provided training, that we enforced our training, but we need to be able to prevent something tangible to MSHA in that respect. So, you know, we want to make sure that we keep that training. Also, you know, this is this is really a similar argument that you make uh, if we're dealing with OSHA and, uh, you know, the defense of an unforeseeable or unpreventable employee misconduct. And in that case, the agent or the operation and the employer can be exempt from a citation or a liability from the agency's standpoint if they can prove that they provided training, they reinforced that training, and they enfor enforce that training, and yet despite all these efforts, the employee still went against it uh, to do something. MSHA is, you've all heard this term at one point or another, whether you're listening to me on a webinar or with an MSHA inspector or an MSHA litigation with uh, someone else, but uh, you probably have heard the term that it is a strict liability statute, the Mine Act, um, and what that means is they can find the company at fault regardless of any negligence. So even if you did that, all those things that would exempt you from a citation with OSHA, uh, MSHA can still just issue you one. That's why we have the option of no negligence when MSHA is filling out a citation. And I think, you know, what we're trying to get at here is if you are dotting your I's and crossing your T's, especially with respect to training, the agency is giving a bit of credit there. Um, and if you are have a serious incident at your facility and it is due really to someone just not following that training and you have those programs in place, um, you will possibly be in the position that you won't receive any enforcement at that point. Uh, again, that's not a bright line. That is not me telling you that you're never going to get enforcement in those situations. Everything is fact dependent, and that includes looking at what inspectors you're dealing with um, and how those areas are going to be conveyed back to management at MSHA. But we are seeing some movement there, so that is a good thing, and we should, as an industry, take I don't want to say take advantage of that, but we should take that to heart and really do what we can to improve and continue to document our training and continue to enforce our training requirements and our procedures and our mindset on our employees. So that was a continuing safety initiative from 2019, the Powered Haulage. Uh, a new one for 2020 is electrocutions. Uh, and again, this was triggered by MSHA uh, identifying what they believe to be several fatalities caused by electrocutions in 2019, as well as a couple of near misses. Um, so what is the agency going to be looking at when they are conducting an inspection uh, into electrocution safety? Uh, primarily, lockout, tagout, right? That's, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, we want to make sure that we have a lockout, tagout, tryout, safety plan uh, and training in place. We want to make sure that we enforce that and reinforce it with our employees that we continue to provide anyone who's going to be doing electrical work, both the task training on that particular element, uh, as well as, you know, overarching electrical safety training. Um, we want to make sure that we're familiar with what I'm sure requires uh, for lockout tag up programs. Now, this might be different uh, if you're in a company that also has OSHA facilities or OSHA um, operations because that is a much different and much more expansive lockout tagout requirement. MSHAs, uh, you just need to make sure that you are aware of it, that you create a program, that you enforce the use of locks and tags. Um, I will say that if you are a mine site um, in some jurisdictions, but the one that comes to mind most 
frequently that I've dealt with is in California. Your mine site will be subject to inspection by the California Occupational and Safety and Health Administration, or Cal OSHA, and they will enforce at the mine their regulation on lockout tagout. That is different than MSHA's regulation on lockout tagout. Cal OSHA's is much more akin to what is included in OSHA. You need to know that because your operation needs to comply with both. Now, I will say that in most cases, following the Cal OSHA regulations is going to satisfy the MSHA regulations, uh, but going the other way does not. For example, when you're with OSHA or if you're at a Cal OSHA, if you have a California operation, you need to have lockout tagout procedures for each individual piece of equipment. Um, MSHA does not require that. So if you have those in place, is, are you going to satisfy MSHA requirements? Yes. If you don't, are you, could you still satisfy MSHA requirements? Yes. But will you satisfy Cal OSHA or OSHA requirements? No. Those are kind of the differences that you need to keep track of uh, based on your operation. And if anyone has operations different jurisdictions, I'm happy to talk about it. California comes up because they are one of the most active state uh, inspections agencies outside of uh, really down in Appalachia. Um, and for the metal and non-metal industry, that is usually the one that comes up with uh, discussions with my clients. So make sure that we're following the lockout tagout. Make sure we know what our lockout tagout procedure requirements are. Um, we also want to make sure that all of our persons are using the appropriate PPE, uh, that we use certified or qualified persons uh, when it is required, and that we are careful, and MSHA calls this working versus troubleshooting, you know, we want to be careful that if we're actually performing work in an area, we are shutting down the power. Um, now, MSHA does allow the operation of equipment um, during, uh, without, I'm sorry, it does allow the operation of equipment while repairs are being performed for testing and adjustment purposes only. Um, if there's no other way to perform the testing or adjustment with the equipment turned off. But you have to take precautions to protect individuals from it. And that can be barriers, that can be, you know, monitoring the area uh, and keeping persons a certain distance back. One area that, or one task that typically comes into question here is uh, training or centering belts on conveyors. That is obviously something that you have to have the machine running. But you have to also take actions to prevent anyone from inadvertently coming into contact with the equipment. Um, and you just have to take a obviously extra and added caution, have the right tools in place, have the right PPE in place uh, when you're doing those kinds of actions. But MSHA is going to be looking at all of these. Do we have the right PPE? Do we have the right training? Are we following those lockout tagout training? Uh, it is going to be something that we should be prepared for because it's going to be an area of focus. Um, we've talked about it a bit, but contractor safety is going to be another safety initiative for MSHA in 2020. The primary area is going to be on training. Now, MSHA found, uh, based on their tallying of fatal injuries in the metal non-metal industry, that roughly 50% of the fatals from 2019 involved contractors. Um, of that, we would already talked that contractors are about 25% of the workforce. Uh, so that is an unusually high level of fatal injuries for a smaller population of the workforce. With MSHA was also a spike for contractors, and they found or determined that most of these involved training deficiencies. So the contractor safety initiative, you know, I think you could probably just as well call it a contractor training initiative, because that is what MSHA is going to be looking at. They are going to be looking at, do the contractors have the right type of training? Um, do they have their site-specific training? What is a production operator doing to ensure that a contractor has the right training when they come on site? I think that's going to be an important one. Um, we all know that MSHA can issue citations to both contractors and production operators for the actions of contractors. And it goes the other way, but you, you don't see that. There is this dual liability, and again, that goes back to strict liability of the Mine Act. Um, we can look at this in detail if we want by going to part 45 of the program policy manual. And in there, you'll find a discussion of 
where MSHA says it's appropriate for an inspector to issue a citation to a production operator for the act of a contractor. And, you know, it, it really is this very, very open-ended section that just discusses that the employer or the production operator um, can be cited for almost any instance when a contractor does something in violation of the act. Um, they have an overarching responsibility for that property, for what takes place on that property, and that includes the contractors that come on it. Um, a great deal of that looks at training, and in it we have, you know, sit phrasings that the contractor has the primary responsibility for ensuring its employees uh, have the appropriate mind safety and health training, or mind safety and health um, appropriate training in terms of being a new miner or being a minor at all or only being someone that requires site specific, but it says in that they have the primary responsibility. That means that there's a secondary responsibility out there and that will fall to the production operator. So when you're bringing a contractor on site, you need to know, are they going to be a contractor that has minors, um, meaning that the people need to have their new minor training and then also need to be updated on their annual refresher training, or are these going to be people that are only on site for infrequent and not extended periods of time, therefore they aren't going to qualify as minors, and all they need is the site-specific training. Um, now, everyone who comes on site should be site-specific, but the other analysis is whether or not the contractor or employees are going to be minors, that needs to be reviewed and you need to have some determination and knowledge of what it's going to be before someone comes on site. Now many contractors already have the new minor training because they know that's going to be something that's required. You're probably going to want a best practice look at that training plan. Ensure that everyone coming on site is actually trained and not someone who was on one of their other facility crews that did not do MSHA sites, but now they're at your facility today. Um, it's more of a burden on the operator to, or production operator, I should say, to make sure that these are done, but it is an important aspect in protecting yourselves and the company uh, from MSHA liability. Because you can, you know, you know you can only do so much managing a contractor. And many times you bring contractors on site because they have expertise doing something that you as a company do not. Um, but nonetheless, those overarching training items, MSHA can bring those back on you. MSHA can cite you. MSHA can also cite you if a contractor is uh, observed doing something inherently unsafe or any actual violation of the act. But especially if we have, you know, contractor walking around not using fall protection in a situation where they would be required to do so. Um, especially if production operator personnel are nearby that can fall back and there can be citations on on the production operator. And I think that is something that you are going to see more of uh, as an industry in 2020. Assistant Secretary Zetezolo, who's in charge of MSHA, said that he is going to okay his inspectors to really utilize that dual citation issuance. And if you're a production operator and you're looking to fight those citations and have them vacated, you need to have, once again, you know, all your I's dotted and your T's crossed. And that means, you know, we reviewed what kind of training was going to be needed. We reviewed the training plan. We reviewed what miners were coming on site and that they had the appropriate training. And we made sure everyone got site-specific training once they got here. Um, some other areas where this might come into play is going to be looking at, you know, is your contractor doing workplace exams? That's a requirement. Um, or are they relying on you to do so? You know, you should have it laid out in their contract or in any other type of agreement what you expect of them when they get on site. And part of that needs to be that contractor should be doing their own workplace exam, regardless of the fact that they might be working in close proximity to your employees you want them to be doing your own as well. And in that, you're probably going to have to put in there something along the lines of if you observe a condition that needs correcting, you need to immediately report it to these persons at our company uh, so that it can be done quickly. So, you know, these are areas that are going to be looked at closer by MSHA. Um, 
and again, a, a big part of it's going to be the training. So who needs what training? Um, if you have questions about what contractors are going to be considered minors as opposed to non-minors and how that affects their training plan, you know, again, I welcome you to reach out and we can talk it through and, and look at what specific uh, activities are going to be conducting while on site and for how long. Uh, but that is going to be an important question that we all should be prepared to discuss with our contractors. Um, kind of a, a brief overview of the rulemaking items on MSHA's agenda, um, just because I think that we are going to be, you know, not looking at a great deal of rulemaking uh, coming forward, but maybe, like as I said, there's there's a couple opportunities. Um, in the pre-rule stage, so we we'll call this the information gathering stage, uh, we have MSHA's rule on crystalline silica or quartz. Um, as part of this, they had a request for information out last earlier in 2019 um, about ways to reduce exposure to crystalline silica. MSHA also last week kicked off their partnership uh, on silica with NIOSH, um, and that is going to be looking at technologies for reducing exposure, for monitoring exposure, uh, and just the overall feasibility of a new rule on that front. Now, as I said before, there's quite a bit of push, um, especially in D.C., for MSHA to adopt the OSHA regulation or some, some variation of it uh, and lower their levels to be a bit more in line because right now MSHA's threshold limit value is um, roughly 100 micrograms per meter cube, which is double MSHA's or I'm sorry, OSHA's uh, permissible exposure level and four times their action level, which in the OSHA regulation triggers a number of obligations by the operator to reduce exposures and uh, protect the employees. So, you know, MSHA is touting right now that they are not getting a great deal of results showing overexposures to the current level, uh, but nonetheless that pressure to reduce what is the current permissible exposure level or threshold limit value um, exists. Uh, so, you know, I think that's an area that we're going to continue to hear about. Um, and, you know, there could be some changes as we move forward. Right now, I also said that um, MSHA has incorporated by reference the ACGIH, or American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, threshold limit value from 1973. Um, so quite an outdated number. Uh, you know, there's possibility they could update that um, piece of incorporated by reference to a more recent ACGIH study, but it is possible, um, you know, doing so would, would bring the level even lower than OSHA's uh, or down to it. So that, you know, from the mining perspective, would be, you know, equally as burdensome for the operation. So right now, there's a lot of research going on uh, determining what kind of effect exposures below the current MSHA TLV can have in long term on miners. And that, again, is uh, unfortunately, both for the research and for the miners that are subject to it, one of the most difficult parts to study for the silica regulations because the latency period between exposure and symptoms can be so great. Um, you know, you're usually looking at, for the most part, 10, 15, 20, maybe even more years before someone comes down with the symptoms to exposure that could have happened and the one they're working. Uh, so determining what happens when you're consistently exposed to less than 100 micrograms per meter cubed as opposed to above, you know, it's hard to quantify that without having a great deal of research done in the meantime. Uh, MSHA is also looking at very early on exposure of underground miners to diesel exhaust. This has gone through several uh, exam periods over the last few years with some program policy guidance. Um, we'll see if they make a move on that. It can also be lumped into really this respirable uh, breathing initiative with NIOSH as well. Uh, they can try and lump those together, although right now they have them separated. Um, in the proposed rule stage, there was a direct final rule. It's listed under the proposed rules, but uh, regarding electronic detonators that MSHA put out last month, um, this was really not a 
very serious rulemaking change, but it was one that was somewhat championed as um, a result of MSHA asking industry what areas can they easily improve upon uh, to make the regulations more up to date. This was really put forth by uh, the Institute of Explosive Makers um, that they felt that the detonator definitions in MSHA's regulations needed to be updated to include electronic detonators as opposed to just electric or non-electric. Um, and so that direct final rule, which should probably go final this week without any uh, issue with the agency, is just updating the definitions. Um, alternatively, there are some petitions for modifications out there, one having to do with uh, surveying equipment. Uh, and then I want to focus more so on number three, which is going to be that powered haulage. And I mentioned that I think this is an area where we could see a final rule. One area in here that I think you could possibly see a final rule on pretty quickly is the requirement of safety programs. Um, the Assistant Secretary has mentioned multiple times he thinks that power haulage, especially haul trucks, should have sensors and backup cameras uh, on them uh, as an added safety feature. You know, I think that's going to get a lot of pushback um, depending on how it's sought to be implemented by MSHA, whether it's going to apply to everything moving forward or equipment from a certain manufacturer date, and, you know, what is that going to look like, uh, especially for the older equipment. But I think the requirement of powered haulage safety programs, which will cover seat belts, operational mobile equipment, and conveyor belts, is something that we could possibly see this year. Um, again, it is a election year, um, so, you know, we have to wait and see which whether or not the Trump administration will still be in power in 2021 or will have a new uh, president, which will change the administration. But, you know, like with the workplace exam rule, it, it is not uncommon for an assistant secretary to try and get one last proposed rule out in the election year so that it is going into effect uh, very near the transfer of power point if the transfer of power is going to happen. Um, so, you know, that is an area where we can see that. Um, a couple more errors we've seen incre uh, changes recently. You know, MSHA every year now does a penalty increase. This was part of a 2016 Inflation Adjustment Act. Um, at first, it, it brought some of the MSHA penalties down a bit because they were increased without going through rulemaking. Now we're getting back up above those levels. Um, so our maximum penalties for 2020 are going to be, uh, if regularly assessed, just shy of 72,000. The minimum is going to be 137. That is not including what you usually get as a 10% good faith reduction um, with MSHA. So you know we probably can expect the average citation to be assessed at, you know, if it's at the statutory minimum, about $125, maybe a little more or less. Uh, with the 104Ds, those penalties have gone up again, uh, and those are minimums, so they will only go above those numbers. Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting is, you know, for the 104B orders, uh, and it is going to be that third one up from the bottom when it says any operator who fails to correct a violation for which a citation was issued, those have a per day penalty that can be assessed. Now, typically, MSHA does not assess a penalty with 104Bs, but, you know, if they want to, if they really want to go that route, they can issue almost 8000 a little over $8,000 a day until that condition is corrected. And that's a very, very powerful tool that uh, MSHA doesn't usually utilize. Uh, the 104B order uh, is also a withdrawal, so it shuts down uh, either that equipment or that area of the operation. But, you know, something I've always, I've always kind of thought MCHA doesn't use 104Bs uh, as much as they could, and I think that is a, a good thing. They should be something that are avoided and not issued if there's any reasonable basis for which an abatement uh, deadline can be extended. But in the event that MCHA does want to really shut down the operation and penalize the operator until the condition is corrected, the 104Bs can come in at almost eight, a little over $8,000 a day. Um, the last topic that we really want to talk about in earnest um, before the 1MSHA initiative is 
MSHA's Metal Non-Metal Workplace Exam Rule. So, as we, as you all know, the first workplace exam rule was proposed in 2016 uh, with Assistant Secretary Joe Main in charge of MSHA, and a final rule was issued in 2017. Uh, when the Trump administration was coming into office. Uh, the 2017 rule uh, went into one final, uh, but then was pulled back into rulemaking by the Trump administration. In 2018, there were some modifications made to the rule, and it finally went into effect at the end of 2018. That rule was enforced for the majority of 2019. While that was being enforced, a challenge to MSHA's 2018 final rule was put before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit by a collection of labor unions. And uh, in that, the court found that MSHA had essentially not made the changes of the rule properly in the rulemaking process uh, by defending why they offered no less protection, uh, and that the rules did offer less protection. The 2018 amendments did offer less of protection to minors than the 2017 final rule. So, in finding that, they ordered MSHA to re-implement the rule as written in 2017. And that is the rule that we are now required to follow. So, what changed? In the 2018 rule, MSHA put in, in rule, and I'm sorry, MSHA put in language in the 2018 amendments that the workplace exams must be completed before or as minors enter an area. The 2017 final rule did not include the phrase or as. It said that workplace exams must be done before minors enter a working area. That is now true. You can no longer do a workplace exam while minors are beginning to work in an area. It has to be done beforehand. The other change was we have this requirement now that on our records we have to record adverse conditions observed. In the 2018 amendments, MSHA added a bit of a uh, record keeping reduction clause that said you have to record all adverse conditions unless abated before minors are exposed. That has been removed as well. So now all adverse conditions observed during a workplace exam must be recorded, even if corrected or abated prior minors entering the area. So this is really dumbing it down, but it is an example that I, I, I think is easy to visualize. If I am performing a workplace exam and I'm walking along a catwalk uh, next to a conveyor and there is a hose left in the middle of that catwalk, before I could pick up that hose, hang it up in its proper place outside the walkway, and I would not have to write that down as an observed adverse condition. Now, I would be required to still write down an adverse condition was observed and it was a tripping hazard and it was this hose in the middle of the catwalk. Obviously, that's a great deal of detail that we don't have to include in our descriptions, but that is where we are. So you have to include everything. You also have to include then the date that it was corrected. Um, so a bit of a record keeping increase. Um, I think that one is probably going to be the more burdensome of the two changes, but the change is you now have to make sure that all workplace exams are done before minors enter an area and that every adverse condition observed is recorded on that workplace exam. And then Consequently, we need to record when the condition was corrected. Uh, with regard to MSHA's blurring, we've already talked about this a couple times, but we know that this was the merger of metal, non-metal, and coal into a single enforcement set area uh, with still somewhat separate enforcement resources. Um, at the end of 2019, uh, 213 mines were blurred. Now. MSHA says right now that's all the mines they intend to blur. That could change at some point in time, but that's where they are right now. Um, the majority of those were coal inspectors being transferred to metal non-metal. There was also some metal non-metal inspectors cross-trained and then put into coal mines. Now MSHA has been uh, sure to mention throughout this that some mines uh, require specific expertise and that is are mostly uh, in their mind, underground coal mines, and those will not be eligible for the blurring at any point in time, or at least at any point in time now. Uh, 
but those mines, 213 mines, many of them kind of along the Ohio River Valley uh, in that area are having inspectors that were previously in coal uh, come out to metal non-metal mines and some coal mines are experiencing metal non-metal inspectors uh, there. For the most part, um, you know, I, I had some issues coming up from clients who have experienced uh, or been about affected by this blur. Uh, most of the inspectors so far have been all right. One of the, I think, unintended consequences that seems to be causing maybe more headaches is the switching of mines into a different district or a different field office or both um, with this realignment and there really not being a great deal of reach out um, by the agency to make that known. You also now have you know, maybe a field office supervisor or a district manager or assistant district, man district managers that don't know you and your operation when you've had that relationship with your existing management structure from MSHA for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so I think that is one area that, you know, MSHA needs to be doing, in my opinion, better do job uh, reaching out to the operations. And I've seen that um, just recently, this past year, or since we've been in 2020, uh, a number of the new district managers at industry events trying to make those connections. So if you were subject to one of those changes, uh, you know, I would encourage you to reach out uh, and just establish that relationship with MSHA. It always is helpful to know your people uh, who are in charge of the inspectors and not be a, you know, new name if you have to call because something's going wrong. Um, Another unintended consequence of sorts is that a lot of the contest of metal non-metal citations are being rolled out to coal districts and coal CLRs or conference litigation representatives. Uh, I've experienced this quite a bit. It is uh, somewhat frustrating uh, because you're used to the people that have a great deal of experience in handling and hopefully resolving metal non-metal citations. I think there's a bit of a learning curve there for both parties. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's, it seems to be a shift in that district office, a shift in also resources, having more coal CLRs that, uh, you know, can handle metal non-metal citation contest. So uh, I expect both of those to continue. In terms of 2020 predictions, what can we look at? Now, these are all my educated guesses, um, some of them. Uh, we've predicted those last couple years and have come to fruition, so we're going to look at, I think, continuations of them. Um, the targeted enforcement and initiatives, those are going to continue. Obviously, we have a couple new ones already rolled out for 2020. Those can get rolled out at any point in time uh, if MSHA sees trends, and I think that it will be a continued effort by the agency to tailor and drill down during their inspections in specific areas. Um, do not be surprised if the health sampling continues to be done more frequently and that if you haven't been subject to health sampling that you are. Um, so just be prepared. If you have any concerns that you're going to be overexposed to silica, you know, I think you probably want to consider getting someone in to do their own sampling. If you are going to have someone come out and do their own sampling, I, you know, I recommend that you you know, talk to some type of legal counsel to see if that can be done under uh, privilege to protect the results, whatever they may be, from being used against the company at some later date and time. Um, that's something that I work with companies quite a bit on, and it has proved worthwhile on multiple occasions. Um, I think that you can see some proposed regulations in silica, and I also think that the powered haulage one might be our most likely candidate. Uh, the turnover in engine management not just the transfer from the blur, but there is a lot of people, both inspectors and some in management, who are kind of reaching that retirement age with MSHA. Um, so I think that's going to be something to watch, how that might be, how that might go in this election year, because typically in election years we can see some turnover at some of those management positions. Um, and then I think, you know, I always end with this one, MSHA's still coming. They still have their twos and fours. Uh, we have seen some reduction in the types of citations written. Uh, we have seen some reductions in the severity of citations written, so that's a good thing, but they're still going to come out and inspect. They're still going to issue citations. Um, you know, they're required to be there two and four times a year, and so we should just continue to be prepared for them to be out there and do that. 
uh, make sure our training is always up to date and that we are looking after our contractors and their training. So with that, I want to thank you all for um, joining me today. As always, don't, uh, don't forget the Amsterdam Defense Report uh, blog. Always is going to have some updates about things we talked about today and other cases that are coming up that affect the mining industry. The rest of the year, we're going to have a number of webinars, um, so I welcome you to join us for them all. Our next one won't be until late March, um, but you know it, it will be a good one. So before the season really gets started up nationwide, uh, we're going to talk about preparing and managing for inspections. So look forward to talking with you all then, and hopefully in the middle. Uh, and I will open it up for any questions that anyone has right now. But uh, as I mentioned before, if you ever want to discuss a question uh, outside of the webinar setting, I will welcome you guys to reach out to me um, by any, my number or email, and happy to talk with you at any time. Thanks. I see a, a couple of questions coming in. One is uh, a question that is, is the company required to maintain copies of workplace exams conducted by contractors on the mine site? Um, so that's a very good question. You are not required to do so, but you will want to make sure that the contractor is doing so. I know a number of operators uh, who are now requiring that the contractors give them a copy uh, each day that one is done. Obviously, that increases your record keeping uh, burden to maintain that, but if it is something that you can scan uh, and store electronically in a file, that is that is fine, that is good enough. Uh, if you want to maintain a hard copy, that is also your choosing. Uh, you want to though, make the contractors aware of that as soon as possible, especially if you are going to make that, um, make that a requirement. You want to make sure they also know that you want to keep a copy of it. I think that is a best practice, uh, but again, there is the, the burden of managing it, uh, make sure you're getting copies, uh, but at the very least, you want to make sure that your contractor knows that they are completing that and have to maintain it each day. Uh, there's also a couple questions about silica uh, and silicosis and how that can be tied back um, and caused by exposure in the workplace um, as opposed to other, wire, other sources of exposure, whatever that might be. Um, that is a very, uh, very detailed question, and, and it deserves uh, a response equally so, I think, more than we have the, the opportunity to discuss right now. But I will say, you know, typically, if an employee can, is diagnosed with silicosis and can uh, reasonably prove that there was exposure in their working history, um, whether by the type of operation work that or the task that they are performing, uh, you know, the courts and the medical professionals are typically pretty willing to say that their silicosis was the result of work exposure. Um, but again, it's, it's a very in-depth analysis that looks at a lot of different factors. How long were you employed in that specific industry, especially for individuals who worked at a number of different operations or in a number of different industries where they could have all had exposure. It's a very complicated uh, process and making that determination. I, I will say it's, it's, a, it's a bit convoluted at times. Um, so I'm, I know that's not a great answer to your question, but um, if you can show that there was some exposure at some point in time to silica, and a lot of that can be tied back to, you know, does the mine have a history of overexposures on the MSHA database? Um, those are things that are looked at to determine whether or not it was work-related. Oh, okay, one more question rolled in. <laughs> so uh, the question is, is the area where mobile equipment is parked considered a work area and need to be inspected as a workplace exam? Um, for the most part, work working places do not include parking lots. That is typically considered to mean employee parking lots. So it depends where the mobile equipment is parked. If the mobile equipment is parked in a ready line area, um, you know, you're going to want to obviously look at that for the purposes of, you know, is it properly berm? Do we have the necessary blocks in place uh, to securely park the equipment? But I don't think MSHA typically consider, considers it a working place for the purposes of a workplace exam. It's going to, though, 
be dependent upon what is immediately around it. If it is just an area where machinery is parked and nothing else, you're probably going to be all right. If it is immediately adjacent to uh, you know, an active mining area or processing plant, uh, it might be considered part of that area uh, for the purposes of the workplace exam. All right, I think those are all the questions we have. If anyone comes up with anything else, uh, the next couple days, I welcome you to reach out to me uh, by my phone or email, and happy to continue the discussion. Thanks for joining, everybody. Have a great 2020.